Okay, we'll start now. Hello and welcome to our third panel in the, in the workshop. And we have now, as um, during the day before, um, three lectures, short lectures, contributions. And I'll introduce first, but in German, Jennifer Pavlik. Jennifer Pavlik is the, seit 2016 senior lecturer für ästhetische und ethische Bildung an der Universität de Luxemburg und war vorher Visiting Assistant in Research an der Yale University und zwischen 2010 und 2014 wissenschaftliche Assistentin am Institut für deutsche Sprache, Literatur und Interkulturalität der Universität Luxemburg. Und sie hat eine ganze Menge äh, Publikationen zu Hannah Arendt. Äh, in Druck ist eine Arbeit über Hannah Arendt über Flucht. Eine andere, die 2017 erschienen ist, äh, widmet sich dem flanierenden Sammeln, Denkbewegungen bei Hannah Arendt und 2015 ist etwas uninteressiertes Weltinteresse, sozusagen eine neue Formulierung des interesselosen Wohlgefallens, über die Ausbildung einer ästhetischen Denkhaltung bei Hannah Arendt erschienen. Ich freue mich sehr auf Ihren Beitrag. Ja, vielen Dank. für die Einladung überhaupt, an diesem Workshop teilzunehmen. Ich freue mich sehr, hier zu sein. Hannah Arendt kann, wenn man sich dem Urteil von Sheila Benabib anschließen möchte, als Klassikerin der Moderne bezeichnet werden. Diese Auffassung impliziert die Annahme, dass ihre Auseinandersetzung mit der antiken Polis nicht darauf abzielt, nostalgische Erinnerungen zu aktivieren, sondern sie vielmehr anhand einer phänomenologischen Relektüre Begriffe und Konzepte offenlegt, die Auskunft über Sinnhorizonte verschaffen und so neue Perspektiven auf gegenwärtige politische Phänomene eröffnen. Eine solche Perspektive bietet Arendt mit Blick auf das politische Zusammenleben in der Moderne, indem sie Kants Kritik der Urteilskraft als seine eigentliche politische Philosophie interpretiert und den Begriff des Schönen als Inbegriff der Weltlichkeit der Welt und zwar für jedermann versteht. Kants Theorie des Geschmacks ist für sie eine Grundlagentheorie des politischen Handelns, weil sie darin eine Perspektive auf die Welt entdeckt, die es ermöglicht, die Gegenstände der Wahrnehmung in ihrer Freiheit zu betrachten. Um die Kritik der Urteilskraft derart politisch interpretieren zu können, muss Arendt notwendigerweise einen Schritt über die kantische Argumentation hinausgehen. Kant proklamiert in seinem Werk die These einer objektiven Theorie des Schönen, und widerspricht damit dem gängigen Diskurs des 18. Jahrhunderts. Er baut seine Argumentation auf der Annahme auf, dass es eben nicht das Objekt an sich ist, das als schön zu bezeichnen wäre, sondern die ästhetische Betrachtung eigentlich erst das erschafft, was als schön erscheint. Er entwickelt also eine revolutionäre interaktionistische Theorie der Schönen, die die Relation zwischen Betrachter und Betrachtetem in den Mittelpunkt rückt. Diese Interaktion baut auf einer ästhetischen Haltung auf, die eine Betrachtungsweise ermöglicht, die die Gegenstände der Wahrnehmung jenseits von Aneignungsstrategien in ihrer vollkommenen Autonomie bestehen lässt. Diesen Grundgedanken nimmt Arendt auf und wendet ihn auf den politischen Bereich an. Konkret geht es ihr um die Ausbildung einer ästhetisch betrachtenden Denkungsart, die die Gegenstände der Wahrnehmung das heißt auch und vor allen Dingen die anderen Menschen, unter einer Perspektive wahrnimmt, die ihnen ihren Freiheitsraum zugesteht und sie jenseits von Zweckmittelkategorien begreift. Diesen Zusammenhang möchte ich im Folgenden skizzieren und damit auf die implizite politische Ästhetik aufmerksam machen, die für Arends Werk konstitutiv ist. Arend schreibt an Jaspers, habe viel gelernt, bin mir vor allem über einiges Methodische klar geworden, was du an mir doch immer so vermisst. Darüber müssen wir sprechen, anhand der Kritik der Urteilskraft. Eine mögliche Begriffsbildung für die historisch-politischen Wissenschaften und repräsentatives Denken in der Politik auf der Grundlage der Urteilskraft. Arends Interesse an Kants Kunstschrift basiert auf dem von ihr konstatierten Potenzial der Urteilskraft, weder auf induktive noch auf deduktive Verfahren zu gründen, sondern den einzelnen Fall, das Beispiel, den Menschen in den Fokus zu rücken. Genau genommen sind es also reflektierende und nicht bestimmende Urteile in der kantischen Terminologie, die Arends Aufmerksamkeit gewonnen haben, da diese Form 
von Urteilen maßstabslos ist und ihr keine allgemeine Regel zugeordnet werden kann. Diese Urteile interessieren Arendt besonders, weil sie sich angesichts der historischen Entwicklung theoretisch in der gleichen Situation vorzufinden glaubt, wie das 18. Jahrhundert im Hinblick auf schiere Geschmacksurteile. Kant war, wie sie ausführt, empört darüber, dass die Frage nach der Schönheit willkürlich entschieden werden sollte, im Geiste des Degustibus non disputandum erst, ohne dass die Möglichkeit von Streitgesprächen und gemeinsamen Übereinkommen gegeben war. Während Kant in seiner Schrift nach Möglichkeiten gesucht hat, objektive Kriterien für das Schöne ausfindig zu machen, sucht Arendt nach Möglichkeiten, wie das menschliche Urteilsvermögen arbeiten kann, auch wenn es keine überkommenden Maßstäbe, keine Moris also, mehr gibt, von denen man sein Urteil abhängig machen kann. Sowohl bei Kant als auch bei Arendt geht es also darum, ohne Geländer zu urteilen, ähm, ohne Geländer urteilen zu können und der Geschmack wird als dasjenige menschliche Vermögen angesehen, das auch in finsteren Zeiten seine Arbeit aufnehmen kann. Der Geschmack, so Arendt, ist das Vermögen, mit dem wir uns in die Welt einpassen, in ihr wählen, was zu uns gehört und was nicht. Dinge, Menschen, Handlungen. Kant hatte Recht, schreibt sie in ihrem Denktagebuch. Geschmack und Urteilskraft sind dasselbe. Das Besondere am Geschmack ist dabei, dass er sich jeglicher Form utilitaristischem Denken von vornherein entzieht und unabhängig von überkommenden Regeln arbeiten kann. Im Geschmack entscheidet sich, wie die Welt qua Welt unabhängig von ihrer Nützlichkeit und unseren Daseinsinteressen in ihr Aussehen und Ertönen, wie sie sich, wie sie an, äh, wie sie sich ansehen und anhören soll. Der Geschmack beurteilt die Welt in ihrer Weltlichkeit. Ihn interessieren weder das sinnliche Leben noch das moralische Selbst, denen er ein reines, uninteressiertes Weltinteresse entgegensetzt. Das interesselose Wohlgefallen, das Kant als Inbegriff des Geschmacks bezeichnet hat, wird von Arendt hier in die paradox anmutende Formulierung des uninteressierten Weltinteresses transformiert, dass das gewaltfreie Gespräch in das Zentrum des politischen Diskurses rückt. Weder praktische noch theoretische Vernunft können das leisten, was der Geschmack, also die ästhetische Urteilskraft, zu leisten vermag. Eine Form des gewaltfreien Reflektierens, das sich jeder Art von Logik widersetzt, die nach Arendt dem Denken einen Zwangscharakter verleiht, dem es sich nicht entziehen kann. Geschmacksurteile erlauben es dagegen, wie Arendt explizit sagt, den Egoismus zu überwinden und die Welt und unsere Mitmenschen möglichst unabhängig von unseren, Intersubi von unseren subjektiven Eindrücken wahrnehmen und beurteilen zu können, gleichzeitig aber an dieser Welt mit Interesse teilzuhaben. Dass diese Betrachtungsweise so etwas wie eine regulative Idee, ein Ideal also ist, darüber war sich Arendt eigens bewusst, da ihr klar war, dass wir uns als Menschen nie ganz von unseren Eindrücken lösen können, die doch unseren ganz spezifischen Zugang zur Welt ausmachen. Mit Hilfe der menschlichen Einbildungskraft können wir aber versuchen, uns so weit wie möglich von unseren Interessen zu lösen. Diese Loslösung basiert auf einer bestimmten Betrachtungsweise, die, so könnte man in Anlehnung an Kants Ausführungen in der Kritik der Urteilskraft sagen, die Gegenstände der Wahrnehmung unter der, unter der Kategorie des Schönen wahrzunehmen und sie, hierfür von, und sie hierfür von den individuellen Interessen zu entrücken versucht. Arendt verwendet den Begriff des Schönen ganz in diesem Sinne dezidiert politisch, wenn sie betont, das Schöne sei im Begriff der Weltlichkeit und in direkter Beziehung zur Humanität stehen zu begreifen, weil man, Zitat, über die Dinge, über die man nicht disputieren kann, streiten kann, weil Hoffnung besteht, untereinander übereinzukommen, auch wo man nicht zwingend überzeugen kann. Arendt verknüpft in dieser Stelle, an dieser Stelle den Begriff der Schönen mit dem Begriff der Humanität und macht deutlich, dass Humanität darin besteht, dass man eine tolerante Streitkultur entwickelt. An anderer Stelle nennt sie die Ausübung oder Einübung dieser toleranten Streitkultur eine Cultura Animi, die durch ein Training in Philosophy ausgebildet werden kann. Was Arendt genau darunter versteht, wird deutlich, wenn man sich in ihrem Werk nach möglichen Vorbildern umschaut, die ihren Geist in diesem Sinne kultiviert haben. 
Neben Kant sind das vor allem auch Homer, Sokrates, Jaspers, aber auch Lessing, Benjamin und weitere, vor allen Dingen Literaten, werden hier zu nennen. Was diese Denker im Kern verbindet und das ausmacht, was politisches Zusammenleben von seinem Grundsatz her bedingt, werde ich im Folgenden anhand von drei kurzen Beispielen in aller Kürze skizzieren. Arendt betont in ihrem Werk, was ist Politik, dass zwischen dem Homerischen und dem Politischen eine enge Verbundenheit besteht, wobei diese Verbundenheit weit über ihre allgemeine Wertschätzung narratologischer und literarischer Formen als besonders freie Formen des Nachdenkens hinausgeht. Sie betrifft die besondere Denkungsart, die Arendt in den homerischen Geschichten vorfindet und die es einerseits den Lesern ermöglicht, ermöglicht historische Ereignisse aus unterschiedlichen Perspektiven zu betrachten, andererseits aber auch die verschiedenen Perspektiven der jeweils beteiligten Protagonisten überhaupt zu würdigen. Sie schreibt, Homer singt den jahrhundertelang zurückliegenden Vernichtungskrieg so, dass er in gewissem Sinne, nämlich im Sinne der dichterischen und historischen Erinnerung, die Vernichtung gerade wieder rückgängig macht. Diese große Unparteiischkeit, hier klingt auch der kantische Gedanke wieder an, diese große Unparteiischkeit Homers, die keine Objektivität im Sinne der modernen Wertfreiheit, wohl aber im Sinne der vollkommenen Freiheit von Interessen und der vollkommensten Unabhängigkeit vom Urteil der Geschichte ist, der gegenüber sie auf dem Urteilen des handelnden Menschen und seinem Begriff von Größe besteht, steht am Anfang aller, nicht nur der modernen Geschichtsschreibung. Homer führt hier den politischen Freiheitsbegriff, der im Zentrum von Arends Werk steht, in besonders anschaulicher Weise vor, da er zeigt, dass der Krieg gegen Troja zwei Seiten hat und er ihn mit den Augen der Trojaner nicht weniger sieht als mit denen der Griechen. Es ist also die von Arendt so bezeichnete homerische Unparteiigkeit, die von den eigenen Interessen absieht und versucht, die Sache wirklich von verschiedenen Seiten zu sehen und sie alle gleichsam zu Wort kommen zu lassen, was nach Arendt die Grundvoraussetzung von politischer Praxis ist. Ganz ähnlich spricht sie von Jaspers, dessen Denken ihr zufolge eine Welt en miniature eröffnet, in der man modellartig erfahren konnte, wie es in der Welt zuging oder zugehen sollte. Denn in dieser kleinen Welt entfaltete und übte sich seine unvergleichliche Fähigkeit für das Gespräch, die herrliche Genauigkeit des Zuhörens, die ständige Bereitschaft, Rede und Antwort zu stehen, die Geduld, bei der einmal besprochenen Sache zu verweilen, ja mehr noch, das sonst Verschwiegene in den Gesprächsraum zu locken, es sprechwürdig zu machen und so alles im Sprechen und Hören zu verändern, erweitern, verschärfen oder wie er es selbst am schönsten sagen würde, zu erhellen. Auch Jaspers Denken zeichnet sich dadurch aus, dass er Dinge ins Zentrum des Gesprächs rückt, die möglicherweise andernfalls im Verborgenen geblieben wären und somit dazu beiträgt, die Vielschichtigkeit der Wirklichkeit überhaupt erst wahrnehmbar zu machen. In eben diesem Sinne geht auch Sokrates vor, wenn er einer Stechfliege gleich auf dem Marktplatz seine Mitmenschen dazu anregt, über ihren Standpunkt zu reflektieren. Von den Logoi, den Argumenten, blieb nie ein Stehen. Sie befinden sich in Bewegung. Und weil Sokrates der Fragen stellte, auf die er keine Antworten weiß, sie in Bewegung setzt, ist es gewöhnlich auch er, der, wenn der Zirkel sich geschlossen hat, fröhlich vorschlägt, wieder von vorne anzufangen und zu fragen, was Gerechtigkeit oder Frömmigkeit oder Erkenntnis oder Glück sein. Das Besondere an all diesen drei Positionen besteht einerseits darin, dass sie paradigmatische Beispiele für Gespräche sind, in denen Perspektiven ausgelotet werden. Andererseits aber auch, dass Homer, Jaspers und Sokrates ihre Gespräche durch grundsätzliche Fragen beginnen und vor allen Dingen bereichern und damit genau das umsetzen, was Arendt als Bedingung einer, wie sie es sagt, wahrhaften politischen Philosophie bezeichnet. Alle diese Denker machen die Pluralität des Menschen zum Ausgangspunkt ihres Taumatsein. Es handelt sich dabei aber eben nicht um das Staunen im Sinne des platonischen Bios Theoretikus, das Arendt als ein Pathos bezeichnet, das der Mensch erleidet und das nicht in Worte gefasst werden kann, sondern um eine Form des Staunens, das auf die Welt bezogen ist und seinen Ausdruck in einer politisch-ästhetischen Haltung findet, die interessiert und distanziert zugleich ist. Diese Haltung, 
die im Sinne des Aristoteles, der aristotelischen Hexes als ein durch Erfahrung erworbenes politisches Vermögen bezeichnet werden kann, findet Arendt explizit auch bei Lessing, wenn sie schreibt, und das ist ein Zitat, dass seine Haltung zur Welt weder positiv noch negativ war, sondern radikal kritisch und, was die Öffentlichkeit anlangte, durchaus revolutionär, aber sie blieb der Welt verpflichtet, verließ ihren Boden niemals und übersteigerte nicht, äh, nichts in die Schwärmerei einer Utopie. Diese politische Form des Staunens bleibt also immer auf die Welt bezogen und versucht nicht aus der Höhle in die wahre, gedachte Wirklichkeit emporzusteigen. Man könnte das eben angeführte Lessing-Zitat nämlich auch als einen kritischen Kommentar zu, zum platonischen Höhlengleichnis lesen. Und diese Haltung findet ihren Ausdruck in eben einer Weltbetrachtungsweise, die radikal kritisch ist. Arendt betont explizit, dass der Grund, warum der Philosoph im platonischen Sinne während des Staunens die Bodenhaftung verliert, darin begründet ist, dass ihm, Zitat, jener sechste Sinn fehlt, den wir nicht nur alle gemeinsam haben, sondern der uns auch in eine gemeinsame Welt stellt und so diese überhaupt erst möglich macht. Zitat Ende. Der sechste Sinn das ist der von Arendt immer wieder so herausgestellte menschliche Common Sense, der Gemeinsinn, den Arendt im Nachlass bezeichnenderweise auch als Community Sense bezeichnet und der letztlich ein ästhetisches Vermögen ist, das den Menschen auf der Grundlage der Einbildungskraft dazu befähigt, sein Denken und Handeln von der eigenen Perspektive zu transzendieren. Die von mir herausgestellte Bedingung politischen Handelns die Arends Werk wie einen roten Faden durchläuft, besteht also darin, eine auf Pluralität beruhende Form des Staunens zu entwickeln, die darin begründet ist, dass der Mensch eine kritisch fragende und das heißt letztlich eine ästhetische Haltung ausbildet. Die Ausbildung einer solchen Haltung, so könnte man mit Blick auf das Thema der Tagung sagen, wird umso dringlicher, als dass sich die Moderne gerade dadurch auszeichnet, dass der Mensch zum Maß aller Dinge wird und er sich nicht mehr auf eine göttliche Orientierung verlassen kann, die ihm eine Orientierung böte. Er trägt damit eine ungeheure Verantwortung für sein Gewissen und das Zusammenleben in einer zunehmend auf Alterität beruhenden Gemeinschaft. Die Gefahren, die in einem Zeitalter drohen, in dem es keine sicheren Maßstäbe mehr gibt, hat Ahrens eigens erlebt und vor diesem Hintergrund eine Theorie entwickelt, die an den Menschen als Wesen appelliert, der und das ist das Interessante an Arends Werk, in sich selber eine auf Alterität beruhende Pluralität entdeckt, die die moderne Gesellschaft widerspiegelt. Die Ausbildung einer ästhetischen Denkhaltung führt daher im optimalen Fall ebenso zu einer Kultivierung des Selbst wie zu einer auf Freiheit beruhenden kritischen Öffentlichkeit und kann daher als Grundannahme des Zusammenlebens in einem modernen Zeitalter bezeichnet werden, da der Geschmack bei Arendt zur entscheidenden menschlichen Fähigkeit avanciert, um auch ohne Geländer adäquat zwischen Gut und Böse zu unterscheiden. Nur wenn der Mensch sich in der Weise, also seinen Geschmack betrachtend kultiviert, kann ihm die Welt, und das heißt bei Arendt ja bekanntlich, das Miteinander anvertraut werden. Das Ästhetische muss daher, so meine These, als inhärenter Denkansatz von Arends Politikverständnis gedacht werden. Vielen Dank. Thank you very much. And now we have a chance to, to hear uh, the contribution of uh, Zoe Roth. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce you. Um, uh, Zoe Roth is assistant professor of French at Durham University with research focuses on two largely topics um, like bodies and Jews. Has been awarded grants and fellowships by the Vienna Wiesenthal Institute, Harry Ransom Center in Austin, British Academy and Leverhulm Trust. Um, I only name some publications. Um, war of Images or Images of War is forthcoming 2018. Frontier Humaine, Race, Nation and the Shape of Representation in Claude Cahun is 2017 uh, to be published in Berlin. And Real and Ideal Spaces, Writing, Embodiment and the Beach in Contemporary French Literature was published 2016. And now we have to hear about uh, forms of totalitarianism and totality of form. So I will not be talking about Jews or bodies or Jewish bodies. 
but I will be talking about form. So there's something there. Um, so I'm an interloper here because I uh, don't really study Hannah Arendt. I'm a literary scholar and I don't speak German. So what can I say? Anyway, okay. Um, so from the touted end of history that Francis Fukuyama uh, so mistakenly announced, um, this end of history in which a free market liberal democracy was going to bring um, about in the wake of the collapse of the Soviet Union, recent events across what I would call the global north seem to have taught us that we can't escape politics. The reemergence of authoritarian administrations, far-right populism, kleptocracies, and cacocracies face us once again with the terrifying specter of totalitarianism. The sense of chaos of a world order upended is intentional. Totalitarianism operates through a kind of logic of an incessant, compulsive movement towards a historical endpoint. And this sows chaos in the present. At the same time, this sense of crisis compels people to resist immediately. And I mean, speaking as uh, an American, you can see the immediate sort of resistance movements that happened um, spontaneously um, when Trump was elected. Um, and obviously, this kind of immediate resistance is often needed to stem the tide of reactionary uh, political movements. But if we can't disrupt the temporality of totalitarianism or step outside of this compulsive motion, um, then how can we prevent it? So, I'm speaking as a literary scholar, um, obviously, and in response to political emergencies, literary criticism, literary scholars have often argued that art and literature and criticism can resist reactionary political forces. Literary criticism, and I'm talking mostly about its Anglo-American configuration, um, is dominated by the view that the aesthetic is shaped by political and historical context. Fields like feminist studies, post-colonial theory, Marxist literary criticism emerged in part as a reaction to traditional formalist approaches to literature that saw literature as autonomous from the social and the political realms. Um, and this idea that somehow you could abstract or remove the work of art from its political context and treat it as a sort of hermetically sealed form. Um, ideologically oriented criticism, like some of that I just mentioned, has often treated this idea, this autonomous idea of form, um, which implies unity and totality, as ideologically suspect. Hannah Arendt's theorization of totalitarian ideology in The Origins of Totalitarianism um, now seems to offer a proof text for understanding current political events. And if you have friends like mine, then your Facebook feed will have been full of Hannah Arendt quotations in the last three months, interspersed with you know, cartoons about Donald Trump and his small hands. Um, and, but this sort of revival of Hannah Arendt and literary criticism has been going on for some time, especially since the sort of multi-directional or cosmopolitan turn in memory studies and its relationship to literature. Um, so it might seem surprising then that I want to turn to her to think about the value of an autonomous aesthetic realm and this idea of a kind of totality of form um, and that these might be useful ways of thinking about the value of the literary or the aesthetic when faced with the specter of totalitarianism. Um, so if we look beyond origins, we, uh, origins of totalitarianism, we encounter a somewhat different errant, one whose civic-minded humanism can feel quite out of step with the sort of ideologically oriented critiques that we find in literary criticism at the moment. Um, but in works like The Human Condition and The Life of the Mind, she argues for a reparative understanding of the world as, I quote, coherent and meaningful. And the work of art helps rebuild or maintain a durable world that will resist the compulsive temporality and programmatic language of totalitarianism. Um, so Arendt never elaborated an aesthetics theory, per se, but her work helps us think through the work of art and the role of criticism during times of crisis. Um, I don't want to suggest that we can entirely separate um, the work of art from ideology, um, but I do think that there are several problems with framing the, the practice of literary criticism in terms of political utility and crisis. 
Um, one is that we risk getting caught up in these same modalities and temporalities of totalitarianism and authoritarianism that I mentioned earlier. Um, we also risk alighting the specificity of the aesthetic or the literary, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that later. But I think even worse, we risk undermining political projects by using ineffective tools. Um, I don't necessarily, I'm not necessarily convinced that literature is, well, I'm definitely not convinced that literature is going to bring down Donald Trump. Uh, he doesn't even read, right? So. <laughs> um, so I think that the, I want to think about the value of the literary or the aesthetic, and I'll use those two terms intermittently here, how its value might lie in its ability to resist the, this kind of instrumentalization of language that we find in totalitarianism, and also to model a form of dispassionate critique, um, a critique of distance that allows us to step back from this kind of immersive temporality of crisis. Um, so Arendt began to think closely about the relationship between the work of art and the political in the human condition, um, but the literary quality of her thinking is already very apparent in her earlier writings. So, um, I mean, in Origins of Totalitarianism as well. Her mode of analysis is tied to the power of storytelling, and there's been quite a lot of work done on the role of storytelling in her, um, in her philosophy, and what she would later call metaphorical thinking. So in a lecture entitled um, On Humanity in Dark Times, where she talks about Lessing, so I'll probably be touching on some of the things that Jennifer did, uh, she wrote that, I quote, no philosophy, no analysis, no aphorism, be it ever so profound, can compare to the intensity and richness of meaning of a properly narrated story. The literary and the aesthetic thus provide a vocabulary, a structure, and a form for Aaron's eclectic political philosophy. So totalitarian language stands in stark contrast to this kind of intensity and richness of meaning that you find in a properly narrated story. Totalitarian language is very banal, so we can think here of, the, of her description of the unthinking Eichmann and her, this idea that cliches and stock phrases and standardized, co standardized codes of expression offer a readily recognizable form that sort of... Um, protects us against the need to reflect on what we're doing. In the absence of imagination, then, totalitarian language works programmatically. It turns prophecies into political realities. Um, so that's by turning the sort of the lies of today into the realities of tomorrow. And we can think of this, um, we see this echoed in declarations about alternative facts, uh, Holocaust centers, that was Sean Spicer, the White House uh, press secretary talking about that, or in the ins insistence that there are no gays in Chechnya, right? So the idea that there will be no gays in Chechnya, that will be the political program. The predictive form of totalitarian language is more important than its ideological content in some ways. And ideologies similarly shape facts into a form that convinces because it offers a kind of total explanation. Um, an explanation that would be entirely improbable outside of the realm of totalitarianism. Um, and this is also this idea of constant motion comes from this idea that um, of this sense of um, perfect internal consistency and the, the idea that somehow um, historical events are going to follow a logical chain to their, to their natural historical conclusion. So things like the, the Thousand Year Reich, for example. Um, and it's also this constant motion, as I mentioned earlier, which makes it hard to reflect on what is going on. So if totalitarianism's form is, uh, rather than its content, is problematic, and if its form is successful by disconnecting itself from reality, then how could a return to an autonomous idea of form or of aesthetic form help us combat totalitarianism? So as I touched on earlier, the aesthetic helps build a durable, lasting world that is autonomous from, but nevertheless shapes the realm of politics. So in the human condition, Erin outlined her theory of human activity. So we have labor, which um, supplies the biological essentials for human life, um, food, shelter, and so on. It's cyclical, it's arduous, um, and it's oriented towards the private realm of the home. 
Work, by contrast, fabricates lasting structures of society that separate humans from nature. So work builds this kind of durable world beyond the utilitarian activity of labor. And art is the culmination of this work because it transforms human emotions and feelings into forms that transcend mortal life. Um, so aesthetic fabrications also take place, or they're fabricated in the private realm, usually, um, but they only achieve their full existence when they enter the public. Um, and so in many ways, they're community-oriented. In this sense, then, I would argue that the aesthetic is the precondition of the political, but it's also distinct from it. And Aaron talks about how action is the, the sort of political activity. So action takes place in the public realm. Um, it's spontaneous. It relates to the interaction between individuals. But the aesthetic and the political share similarities in that they both, um, I quote, require a community of human beings. And freedom is incipient in both. So it's a possibility um, of both of them because they're not determined by the, uh, the necessity of labor. So because the work of art transcends the immediacy of political action, it can provide a space beyond the temporality of crisis that sustains totalitarianism. So Aaron, for example, argues that narratives, um, I quote, permanence and persistence, its ability to move beyond the individual consciousness or mind while retaining an autonomy from the political order, that this is what helps build a durable world. So literature then might be valuable not necessarily as a reflection of the political, but as a space distinct from the political. Another aspect um, of the way that we might think about how literature relates to totalitarianism or the aesthetic relates to it is that because the aesthetic has no utilitarian value, it resists the instrumentalization of language that is a defining aspect of totalitarianism. And in fact, art is, art's value is embodied by its lack of functionality, right? So the, the, a painting is quite different then a durer is quite different than this table that we're sitting at. And that's also what makes it more durable because it, we're going to use a table over and over and over again, whereas the, the work of art is protected and there's a kind of heritage, cultural heritage associated with it. Um, so Aaron, um, Arendt argues um, that, I quote, the standard by which a thing's excellence is judged is never mere usefulness, but it's, in it's adequacy or it's inadequacy to what it should look like. In other words, um, I would say, to the standard by which it will be judged in the world. So in this sense, the work of art can resist the in instrumentalization because it's judged on whether it's effective um, rather than useful. And when I mean effective here, I also mean that in a kind of pedagogical sense in, in how I teach my students. It's what are the effects of this poem or this painting, um, not necessarily whether it is successful in and of itself. So things like, does it move us? Um, does it communicate or make us recognize a truth? Does, it, does its content and its form align to produce a harmonious whole? Um, is it beautiful, sublime, intentionally ugly? So these are aesthetic questions. Um, of course, we can't, we can't separate aesthetic judgments um, from the political. So obviously, the question of what is beautiful has, you know, is, is also has political implications. Um, but aesthetic perception, which is based on being able to tell one thing from another, um, and from there to establishing a, a hierarchy or a relation between things, um, is what determines the organization of the political. So it has the potential also to reform the political, to, to change the organization of it. And, and in this sense, I think that there are um, resonances between Jacques Rancière, who talks about the, di the distribution of the sensible, and Arendt. Um, so to illustrate these ideas, I propose reading a passage from Arendt in terms of its form, its literary form, rather than its political context, content. So to read it for its aesthetic possibilities. So I think you, I gave you guys a handout. It's very old school. Um, but I didn't send my PowerPoint in time. I'm sorry. Uh, so I think it's quite easy to read this passage as being as speaking very much to the political context in which we uh, in which we find ourselves uh, today, but I think it's also useful to think about this as um, as an operation in the possibilities of the aesthetic. So 
Um, this passage is from um, On Humanity in Dark Times, which I mentioned at the beginning, in which Arendt explores Lessing, and Le Lessing she admired for her, his open-ended cultural criticism, which refused to be defined by a consistent, ideologically pure point of view, and which thus remained open to new experiences. So this refusal to be pinned down to a definitive point of view also shapes Lessing's aesthetics, which are concerned with the worldly space, as Aaron calls it, that emerges between the perspectives of spectators, the artist, um, and so on. So I think for me, what's most valuable about this essay is less the historical parallels that she's drawing between Lessing's time and her own, um, and more the outline of a critical posture or position that she develops. And this is a, this is a posture that cultivates autonomy um, or distance from the compulsive logic of ideological movements. So the passage is situated um, at the beginning of the essay's first section, in which he's introduced the importance, sorry, I'm just going to check my time. My watch broke, so. Okay, you'll okay that should be enough. I won't subject you to more than that. Um, so she, so this passage that I've given you is situated at the end of the first section of the essay, in which she's introduced the importance of Lessing's self-thinking, so self-thinking, this thinking independently for oneself. Um, and this, I mean, I really find this passage extraordinary, and it's this beautiful extended metaphor, which Arendt is obviously very good at, in which she surveys the ruined landscape of Europe's past, the remains of this worldly space um, that I was talking about, in which, I quote, the pillars of the best known truths, and she takes this phrase from Lessing, are now shattered and strewn. So like Walter Benjamin's Angel of History, which is caught up in the ca catastrophic storm of progress, we need only look around, according to Arendt, to see that we're standing in the midst of a veritable rubbish heap of such pillars. So the passage begins um, with a, a rather tentative suggestion that the, the sort of ruins of this edifice of knowledge that she's looking at, um, that in fact these ruins might release thought or thinking from the previous stranglehold of accepted truths, right? So allowing thought to move freely um, without pillars or props and without crutches over an unfamiliar terrain. Um, of course, these pillars are not only accepted worn out truths, but also the political order. And the destruction of the political order is often accompanied by violence. And this is evoked in the middle of the passage by this um, image of being violently wrenched into the temporality of crisis. This allusion to violence is then quickly anchored in a historical reference to the great failure of the French Revolution. And I mean, she says French Revolution, but I think she also means French revolutions. Um, and this way in which the French Revolution is taken as often um, for better or worse, a model for the cyclical nature of revolution, these, the sort of seasons of regeneration and failure um, that are part of revolution. Um, and that it's precisely this cyclical nature, this kind of return of a political order and then the destruction of a political order, um, which make the world increasingly fragile until, as she says at the end, those best known truths have become so self-evident that scarcely anyone believes them anymore. So she ends then with another historical nod to a foundational Western political order, so to the American Declaration of Independence. Remember, Bella, we were talking about self-evident truths yesterday? <laughs> um, revealing the fragility of these universal values. So the passage comes full, full circle at the end to the impossibility of building a new edifice upon old ruins, which provide a poor foundation for future stability. Um, so in other words, the solution can't merely be political, but neither can it be wholly critical. By critical, I mean in terms of criticism. It must also be aesthetic. There must be something on which to comment, something that will help reconstruct the reality, um, the worldly space um, that has been destroyed. And, and I think this is where she talks about constellation, a constellation towards the end of the passage. And I think it's precisely this idea of the way that the aesthetic constellates different viewpoints. Um, the viewpoints of those, as she writes in the passage, who inhabit this world and move freely about in it, and who need these pillars in order to guarantee continuity and permanence. Now, Arendt doesn't mention the work of art in this passage. Um, 
Rather, I argue this passage is the work of art. It models the process of aesthetic fabrication. It begins by picking its way cautiously over this unfamiliar terrain. But as the passage's content becomes more critical of political solutions, so too does um, its um, so, do, so too does its aesthetic force grow. So we have this imagery of space and structures, of pillars, foundations, and props. Um, and within this seemingly concrete material world, you also have different tempos and rhythms of movement um, that create an internal tension. So there's the quest, there, there's sort of balance and instability, permanence and violent wrenching, so that the rhythm of the passage seems poised between the possibility of reconstruction and the threat of ruination. So Aaron's literariness models a form of thought that is effective precisely because the language is not functional, permanent because it's not beholden to the temporality of crisis. Her aesthetic fabrication embodies the durability of the work of art. I think also, um, by way of conclusion, that it provides a blueprint for a critical position that she elaborates later on in the, um, in the essay. She values Lessing's inconsistent critical stance, but she also faults him for giving into the seductions of compassion. She acknowledges that compassion is a proper response when confronted with the spectacle of suffering, but that it remains a weak basis for ethical action. Like fear, uh, compassion is a passive affect. It's a passive emotion. It can overwhelm our critical faculties. So in this passage, then, I want to suggest that Arendt's spatial and material metaphors are about creating an aesthetic distance, an autonomy, if you will, um, that will allow us to step back and take measure of the world. So another way of thinking about the autonomy of the aesthetic in a way that's pertinent to our political moment would be in the way that it promotes um, distance rather than compassion. Now, in literature, literature has long been seen as um, a form of moral education or of inculcating empathy. And we see this both in literary texts themselves, you can think about Flaubert or Zola, or in debates about literature, so Martha Nussbaum's um, debate about empathy and emotions is the, you know, one of the most sort of paradigmatic. Um, but I don't necessarily think we should presume that encountering the other will lead to empathy or that empathizing with the other has inherent value, that it will somehow trigger ethical action. We often empathize with individuals who are most familiar or similar to ourselves, rather than, con that rather than confronting the consequences of long-term crises. And this is why Americans um, get themselves up into a huff about a boy who floats away in an air balloon, but they don't do anything about the Mediterranean crisis, refugee crisis. Um, so in her analysis of Lessing, Arendt observes that, I quote, the world is not humane just because it is made by human beings. It becomes humane when it becomes an object of reflection. And that humanness, Arendt writes, should be sober and cool rather than sentimental. We can't allow the exigencies of political crisis to overwhelm our critical capacities. Trump's victory, Brexit's success, Marine Le Pen's ascendance. You can see where my political uh, affiliations lie, obviously. Apologies to any right-wing uh, neocons in the room, um, that these crises are not unique. We must not allow the temporality of crisis to determine how we think, fabricate, or act, because we will always, Arendt reminds us, live in dark times. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. And now we have the third contribution by uh, Rosanna Amiragian, and she's a lecturer at the School of Sociology at the Yerevan State University, translator, copywriter, and media researcher. Received a BA in Political Science and Translation Studies from Open University of Armenia, MA in Political Science from American University, and a graduate certificate in Public Relations and Marketing from Yerevan State University in 2008. There are some publications I only mention Hannah Arendt with refugees in Armenian, group of translators, or the mythology in the political discourse of Armenia in tradition and modernity in Armenian culture. I'm now looking forward uh, to hear your uh, lecture. Uh, thank you very much. You want to go no. to the... No? Okay, you okay. stay here. Okay, but no problem. Can everybody hear? When I, when of I course. Okay. 
Okay, so I will reflect on some of the problems that I encountered as a translator in trying to translate one of her, Hannah Arendt's uh, less quoted essays, The Expansion. Thank you. Expansion and the Philosophy of Power. Uh, this was an experimental translation that was done within the American University of Armenia a translation studies uh, program and that um, gathered a group of translators. So we tried to translate this work and um, we actually came up with a book. Uh, actually, we followed, we had two major uh, reasons to do this. One of, uh, one of the, them was the increasing social demand for political literature, for, uh, for the critical works which have not yet been translated into Armenian, well, there is a, a need, a demand, a public demand, and the other one was educational, uh, since it was done within a university. So, along with translation, we, me as uh, part of the translators group, uh, I separated some of the research problems that I encountered within the translation as I translated, moved forward uh, with the translation. So, uh, some of them are below, I will read them through. How Aaron's vision of power is relative by the means of the Armenian language and what may be the boundaries of its perceptions on public level. What equivalences exist in Armenian for Aaron's concept of power? What translation tools are applicable to convey this meaning in Aaron's interpretation? And what extra linguistic factors affect the process of translation? So, but to start the translation, we had to, first of all, to operationalize this concept. Uh, I will only reflect to some of the view, uh, views, to some of the viewpoints uh, about what power is. So Robert Dahl uh, says an intuitive, it is an intuitive notion which does not have a formulated definition rigorous enough to be of use in the systematic study of this social phenomenon. Power can be defined in terms of the relation between people it makes possible to the, uh, possible a statement of power comparability or the relative degree of power held by two or more persons. There is a, uh, because there is a long history attached to such words as power, influence, control, and authority, and it, it is highly important that a distinction is made among those concepts. Power has basis, which is the legitimacy, uh, the means by uh, which it is uh, practiced, the instruments, a scope, uh, which uh, Dahl says are the responses that, that the, the power structures get from those um, who have uh, given them this power, and probabilities, like the measure of power. Uh, there are also reflections by Foucault, and, of course, by Arendt. Uh, she clearly defines the difference between what is power, what is violence, what is strength, what is force, what is authority in one of her essays on violence. Although there is a time gap between those two essays, the first one was written in 1946 or published, the other one in the uh, 70s, uh, the, this was still very instrumental in identifying w how should we read, how should we render the concept of power when translating. So um, I, I will slightly re reflect on uh, how Aaron sees power. So the concept of power, according to Aaron, is that uh, it should be di distinguished from other forms of. Uh, of, this, of a close notion like strength, force, authority, and violence. Power corresponds to the human ability not just to act, but to act in concert. It is never the property of an individual, but rather belongs to a group and remains in existence only so long as the group keeps it together. Individual power implies empowerment by a certain number of people to act in their name, rather refers to strength. As opposed to power, she says, 
Strength uh, designates something in a singular and individual entity. In, it's inherent in an object or person and belongs to, the, to its character, which may prove itself in relation to other things or persons, but is independent of them. A strong person can be overpowered by others, united to ruin the strength because of its independence. Force, in its turn, is often used synonymous to violence, especially if violence serves as a means of coercion, but should rather be reserved for forces of nature or of circumstances, uh, which means that it should indicate the energy released by physical or social movements. As to authority, it relates to the most elusive of the phenomena and therefore, as a term, Arendt says, most frequently abused is most frequently abused and can be vested in persons. Um, violence is the instrument. Uh, it is very close to strength since the, it, implement, uh, it is the way of implementing uh, the power like other tools um, and is uh, designed to multiple the natural strength. The next step that um, translation required to understand how this concept had to be uh, interpreted was to identify what is the uh, limits of this concept, of the word, how, what are the equ equivalents that are available in the Armenian language. And it appeared that there are scores of ways of interpreting this word, which is most often used in the way that are in the post the power as, uh, as close to violence and to force. So uh, this helped us to identify the problems with the translations and uh, with the translation of her text and to understand how close we can stay, how um, loyal we can stay to Arendt, which was an ultimate goal for us because we, we had in mind the necessity to deliver this text to public. Equi equivalence is a central concept and a strategic approach in translation and is often referred to as a measure of quality. Yet e equivalence is um, a problematic thing since it can be seen in uh, two, at least two major levels, purely linguistic and extra linguistic. And the second one is the one that refers to the cultural perceptions of the powers, uh, of, of the concepts that, like the power, uh, which are being translated. So, as uh, Venuti once for, uh, said, translators act as agents who in a visible or invisible guise can emphasize the text's otherness or familiarity from a target culture, culture point of view. As a result, depending on the degree of visibility and acceptability with which translators wish to endow a text, they employ different strategies of foreignization or domestication. Uh, to uh, analyze the results, uh, I used the translation procedures which Vinay and Darvernay offered in late 50s. And I will reflect on some of them. Uh, the, there are actually seven of them. Three of them are, are he defines them as direct uh, procedures, and others are oblique, like indirect ones. The direct ones are borrowing, uh, calcs, and literal translations, while the remaining four are the transposition, which is replacing one word class with another without changing the meaning, modulation, variation of the form of the message by changing the point of view, equivalence, which is using different stylistic and structural methods to produce validly adequate target text, and adaptation, which is the ultimate uh, way of translation and procedure, used to, for situations when the source language message is unknown in the target culture and therefore requires creation of an equivalent situation or sometimes expanding or uh, um, rendering uh, in um, not just equivalent term or a word but adapt the situation and the term and sometimes introduce new ones. 
So uh, the findings are because this is an English, um, it was translated from English into Armenian, and I suppose the, uh, the reading Armenian is at this point is <laughs> useless. I will rather uh, point out some of the findings that uh, we had. There are possibilities of multiple interpretations of the term power in the source text, first of all. And this is uh, because of the time gap when the text was written and when uh, actually Arendt herself identified and defined what she meant by power. In the, uh, allowing, allowing this allows us for the use of more than one normative equivalent of the same concept. For example, in uh, this uh, sentence, I will, it's very short, I will read, here it becomes quite clear that the organizing power of a political body cannot be illimited, which is actually a strange English word, because the genuine consent at its base cannot be stretched indefinitely. This organizing power here is not, uh, very close to the definition of power which she brought in her essay on violence, but rather is uh, closer to the notions of might, force, or ability. It depends on the translator to choose uh, which one uh, is uh, fit more. In another example, power appears more as a force or authority, which should, in fact, she differentiated in her later essay. The second finding is that the universal universality of accepted and available procedures in translation uh, are, are questionable in that they uh, are not always universal. They are not universal. They are culture specific and sometimes require other solutions which are not usually accepted as set uh, normative tools when translating. Uh, in this regard, literal translation as to this very text and based on our strategic purposes, literal translation was instrumentally acceptable, yet it required differentiation of formal, form, a formal type of literal translation which provides formal conformity of the target text to the source while reducing some of the con connotative richness of the concept. And I guess this is unavoid unavoidable as long as we don't have uh, new concepts or new meanings in, in the existing concepts. Another one was inapplicability or partial applicability of equivalent translation due to the resulting losses in connotative aspects of the concept that's actually very close to the literal translation. The adaptation technique, which might seem the most relevant in this situation, uh, bared, uh, bears the risk of underreading or overreading the concept. Besides, there was not enough justification for not using the existing one, whatever the dictionary suggested, or whatever the existing other translations or interpretations suggested. And uh, thirdly, uh, we came to the conclusion that some of these concepts, there are other concepts of, of course as well, but power, in, we, we were considering power, rather needs the expansion of the existing definitions, which cannot come um, uh, by a one translation, but rather needs to be a result of long Time, time of work and we need a critical mass of translations to understand that this concept needs to be expanded. So the conclusions are that the standardized normative procedures of translation have limited applicability to some of the basic concepts of, in political theory, specifically the concept of power. Another one in, in the case of Armenian is the, notion, uh, is the concept of nation, which does not have um, pure equivalent because of other meanings to the that are within the word the Armenian word. So this has been a case uh, which has been discussed for quite long after independence. This is particular. This uh, refers to, uh, especially uh, to the cases when the author, in this case Hannah Arendt, had has her own thesaurus, has her own words, has her own definitions, and we cannot travel too far from her. 
virtually possible revision of standardized equivalence or introduction of new terms which can be generated in the course of the translation require a critical body of relevant translations and texts, and of course this is a matter of time. Culturally conditioned concepts and words are supposed to emerge along with the shifts ongoing in the political culture as we cannot uh, act or live separate from the uh, situation, from the context in which we are existent. And so, as I told, it's a matter, of course, uh, of, of time. Translations are instrumental at the same time for revision of existing interpretations of old concepts and introduction of new ones, and I hope very much to stir public debate. That's it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. You offered as a precious gift some minutes for discussion additionally, and now we have time. Uh, who wants to start with a question or a comment? Zunächst einmal vielen Dank für Ihren Vortrag zur Kritik der Urteilskraft und zum ästhetischen Urteilsvermögen bei Hannah Arendt. Ich hätte noch eine Frage dazu. So wie Arendt das als ästhetisches Urteilsvermögen beschreibt und wie sie es von Kant her aus dem Schönen nimmt, befinden wir uns ja zunächst einmal im Bereich der Kunst, auch der Kunstbetrachtung. Und da ist es ja sehr einsehbar und nachvollziehbar, dass sich da eben auch ein Sensus communis, ein friedlicher, herstellen lässt. Also das leuchtet sofort ein, sozusagen über eine, eine bürgerliche äh, äh, Kunstbetrachtung auch. Die Frage ist, was gibt denn Arendt das Zutrauen, dass sich das sozusagen so komplikationslos und einfach auch ins Politische übertragen lässt? Ja, vielen Dank für diese Frage, die natürlich eigentlich äh, den Finger, wenn man so möchte, da auch in die Wunde legt. Äh, und ich habe das in meinem Vortrag nur ein bisschen gestriffen und äh, darauf hingewiesen, dass das ja eigentlich so etwas wie eine regulative Idee ist, dass sich dieser Sensus communis vom Bereich der Kunst auch in den politischen Bereich transformieren lässt. Und Are geht da auch explizit darauf ein. Also sie sagt, dass äh, wir natürlich jetzt nicht vom uninteressierten, äh, vom interesselosen Wohlgefallen sprechen können, sondern dass wir diesen eher a priori verstandenen Vorgang äh, bei, bei Kant äh, durchaus äh, in den Bereich des a posteriori verschieben müssen. Also sie sagt da auch, dass äh, das Urteilen eigentlich diese, diese Unterscheidung sprengt. Das heißt, hier findet durchaus eine Verschiebung statt. Und äh, Arendt nimmt jetzt nicht die, das kantische Vokabular eins zu eins und wendet es einfach auf den Bereich des Politischen an und glaubt, dass in dieser Übertragung da nichts sozusagen mit dem Ausgangsmaterial passiert. Sondern es ist für sie, so lese ich das zumindest, so etwas wie ein Begriffsinstrumentarium, was sie vorfindet, um etwas mit Blick auf ihre eigene politische Theorie begrifflich, anschaulich zu machen. Also, so wie Arendt das konzipiert, ist es nicht gesetzt, dass wir das Schöne wahrnehmen können, sondern es ist sowas wie, ja, letztlich auch eine ethische Implikation. Wir sollten als Menschen versuchen, eine ästhetische Perspektive oder auch eine ästhetische Haltung auszubilden, und Menschen wie Kunstwerke wahrnehmen. Aber dazu gehört natürlich immer auch so etwas wie ein Wille dazu. Und äh, das ist durchaus ähm, ja, so etwas wie eine Utopie. Aber das gibt es ja, also Arendt sagt ja zum Beispiel auch im Zusammenhang mit der Räterepublik, äh, wo sie gefragt wird, ob das denn realistisch ist, was sie hier ausbuchstabiert. Da sagt sie ja explizit, naja, gerade nicht, aber möglicherweise doch irgendwann. Und genau in dem Sinne interpretiere ich auch Ihre Kant-Lektüre als so etwas wie einen Denkansatz, den wir verfolgen sollten, wenn es uns denn wichtig ist, eine politische Gemeinschaft auf der Grundlage des Gemeinsinns und auf der Grundlage von Freiheit zu etablieren. Mhm. Mhm. Um, ich wollte eine etwas grundlegendere Frage stehen. Am Schluss habe ich das so verstanden, dass die kritische Frage im Grunde das Ästhetische ist. Mhm. Ähm, und da, da hadere ich jetzt so gerade ein bisschen mit der Verbindung zwischen den beiden. Also grundsätzlich habe ich das begriffen mit dem Urteilen, aber ähm, ist die Ästhetik dann einfach 
der Gemeinsinn zurück? Oder was, was ist das Ästhetische an der kritischen Frage? Ja, also die kritische Frage ist sowas wie der Startpunkt, um einen ästhetischen Raum zu eröffnen. Die kritische Frage ähm, eröffnet sowas wie eine Haltung des Staunens. Das war mir wichtig äh, herauszustellen, weil Arendt ja an einer Stelle sagt, wenn es wirklich irgendwann darum gehen soll, dass wir eine politische Philosophie äh, entwickeln, dann müssen wir eben den Menschen nicht ähm, im Singular denken, sondern im Plural. Und dann müssen wir diesen Menschen im, oder die Menschen im Plural auch zum Ausgangspunkt des Staunens machen. Und das Staunen beginnt ja damit, dass wir Fragen stellen und interessiert sind an den verschiedenen Perspektiven, äh, sodass das Fragen, das kritische Fragen sozusagen der Startpunkt ist für einen ein Raum, der sich eröffnet durch eine ästhetische Betrachtungsweise. Ja? Und in dem Sinne ist eben der Begriff des Schönen auch nichts Statisches. Also es ist jetzt, geht jetzt nicht so sehr darum äh, zu sagen, dass dieser Gegenstand ist schön, sondern das Schöne ist bei Arendt, ähm, so würde ich das lesen, durchaus auch in Anlehnung an Kant eine Betrachtungsweise, also ein Raum, der sich eröffnet. Und damit auch eine bestimmte Perspektive, unter der ich Menschen wahrnehmen kann. Und das fand ich, wurde auch in Ihrem Vortrag ganz schön deutlich, dass es eben ja darum geht, dass, dass das Schöne auch nur in der Praxis entstehen kann, also im gemeinsamen Handeln und eben nie, wenn ich auf Menschen und auf die Welt utilitaristisch zugreife. A question uh, to you, uh, Dr. Roth. Um, in quite a few places, when Arendt is using the word beautiful, She's uh, using it with the word good and bad. So she said the, the, like the byproduct of thinking would be the ability to, say, to distinguish good from, ba uh, good from bad and uh, ugly from beautiful. And so the ethical comes with the aesthetical. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering how does that work with your um, uh, presentation about the uh, autonomy of the aesthetic? How, how does that relate? Yeah, so I think, I mean, obviously the question of ethics comes into it because if you think about aesthetic perception, if aesthetic perception is based on the distinction of difference, and that, that automatically brings up the question of aesthetics because how do you then, cre you know, how are hierarchies created within, with difference? Um, so I think that, um, I think the way that, I mean, and this is not necessarily something that I have looked at in, in Arendt, but she has helped me think about this, is to think about the way that the aesthetic, if, if it's the aesthetic that underpins um, the perception of difference, then teaching ourselves to perceive differently can also have ethical consequences in terms of being able to reform the way that we perceive these differences, whether those are social or political or between individuals. And so it's about... Uh, from politics and ethics to the No, I would say it's, no, I mean, I, I would say it's from the aesthetic to the political, but I'm a formalist, so <laughs> I don't, I, for me, and in terms of the work of art, the, the context-based approaches, to me that doesn't say anything about what the work of art does. It talks a lot about what has perhaps um, social and cultural meanings, but those social and cultural meanings are quite different from what the literary aesthetic does. When you look at, for example, the representation of race in literature, the, the discourse of race and the way that it's represented in, in literature, I mean, that's quite broad, race changes, gender changes. It's, there's something specific to the literary, to the aesthetic, which cannot be re determined or reduced to the political, but I think it's precisely that possibility, that change that takes place in the aesthetic, which is a way if, of flipping it on its side and saying that's a way of changing how these discourses are constructed in the world also. So I suppose that's how I would get at it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I have also one question to Zoe. Uh, the question is, <laughs> if it's uh, today, in 2017, uh, still the term totalitarism is uh, still a term that is uh, good to use for the national socialism. I mean, if uh, we see especially Arendt's definition of uh, totalitarism, which uh, was uh, created, uh, I think the book was published in the beginning of the 50s, mm -hmm. so she started to work directly after 45, 
like uh, Europe was destroyed, the pictures from the liberated camps were everywhere. And um, of course, in national so in, in the Nazi Germany, there was a lot of terror. We don't have to discuss this. There was the Gestapo, there was the SS, there were all the camps, the concentration camps, the det detention camps, uh, the SS camps. But uh, the terror in the National Socialism was, of course, against the enemies of the regime and to all people who were not categorized as part of the so-called Volksgemeinschaft. But I think the most Germans and Austrians people, the society in Germany, in Austria, they were part of the Volksgemeinschaft and they were profiteure of the Nazi regime. <laughs> And if we use nowadays this term totalitarianism, it implicates one, I think, really problematic thing. And this is that all the people in Nazi Germany in Austria were kind of victims. This is like the contrary part. Like, a, so I'm wondering if it's a still a concept that uh, makes sense to use nowadays. So yeah, so I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I didn't, and I didn't really um, theorize totalitarianism, which is a separate question. Um, I mean, she, but she also talks, she's not just talking about Nazi Germany. I mean, she, in her theory of totalitarianism, she's also talking about Soviet totalitarianism as well, which is a different case. I mean, and I do think, you know, um, we need to be careful about extracting from her analysis things that are that we can somehow apply to what is happening today. But I think that her analysis of, so for example, the question of terror, right, is completely different. But I think that her analysis of the way that ideology um, and totalitarian language and propaganda work are still ways that this idea, this kind of instrumental use of language is still something that we see. So, I mean, in terms of contemporary politics, um, I, no, I don't, and that's why I used at the beginning the term the specter of totalitarianism, which is a kind of fear that this is going to come back, which is precisely why we have these symptomatic readings of Arendt at the moment, right? It's because she seems to be, you can read it as predicting some kind, or you, you could, you know, if you want to, read it as predicting some kind of coming catastrophe in that sense. Um, I think we should also be um, cautious about instrumentalizing Arendt in that way, precisely because there are big differences. But I do see in her analysis of language, totalitarian language, an ideology, something that is works um, that we still see in, in far right movements or right movements. I mean, there's the, the, the kind of programmatic aspect of it is something that is, that is still there. Now, what happens is that, do we still call that totalitarian? Probably not. I mean, Trump's not a totalitarian, you know? Uh, he's too incompetent to be a totalitarian, <laughs> I think. Uh, but, you know, so does that, is there new forms? You know, would you call it authoritarian? Would you call it a kleptocracy uh, that's emerging in, in different areas in the West? It's, I don't think we can necessarily name that thing now. But thinking about Aaron will help us name that thing in the future. My question is actually um, addressed to Zoe, and um, as uh, we touched base uh, during lunch, uh, I also I taught uh, English literature for a long time, but then I went on to teach uh, European intellectual history. So I have a few questions uh, for, uh, about your paper, and thank you for the brilliance of the paper. And um, first of all, you mentioned uh, the temporality of um, of totalitarianism as future orientation, but I would just like to point out that um, future orientation is by no, no means uh, limited to totalitarianism. Um, as uh, Kosalek pointed out, um, during, uh, in, the, in the period of uh, what he called the Sato Zeit, um, from 1750 to 1850, uh, European languages were highly charged with uh, the future. And for example, all forms of isms, I mean, which uh, mushroomed in the 18th century, were, I mean, were connected to, to the future orientation, because uh, at that time, um, uh, I mean, uh, po European politics were highly charged with, wish I mean, the vision of the future, for example. Republicanism justified itself, not in terms of uh, what it was at that time, because it was only a very small movement at that time, but it justified this, uh, itself in terms of the future that it promised for humanity. So, um, so in other words, future, the future temporality is by no means um, 
limited to totalitarianism. And uh, you, I mean, that claim, I, I'm afraid, it would rule out a lot of the uh, progressive movements as well. I mean, in, including um, avant-garde art. I mean, if we, we, we deal with uh, yeah, art. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, and, um, yeah. I just, I'm curious, because also, there, mm -hmm. we don't have that much time. And I want to make sure mm -hmm. that also, um, I'm sorry, what's your name? Rosanna gets a question as well. So I will address the, t the temporality. And then if there's time, why don't we come back to another question? Just to make sure. I absolutely agree with you. It's not, it's not specific to totalitarianism. Um, and I work on avant-garde movements as well, in which, but I think that, the, that, that, that future orientation can be dangerous on both the left and the right. I, I'm not going to somehow uh, write it off on the right either, but I, on the left either. But there's a tension because it's not simply future oriented. It's also about going back. It's about mm -hmm. going. It's about traveling via the future to an ideal past. Also. Yes, yes, but that is not that. That's not necessary. That does not by itself make it totalitarian. No, no, but I don't. And, I didn't mm -hmm. claim that it makes it mm -hmm. totalitarian. Mm -hmm. But I think that ta thinking about the ways in which Arendt is being used today in literary studies, mm -hmm. and that she's being used to to think about what is the moment we're living through, is this the advent of a new totalitarianism? Uh -huh. um, I would probably say no, I'm not necessarily coming down on that, but I do think that that doesn't preclude the fact that that kind of discourse about, about the future is used in, in other moments. It's not specific to totalitarianism, but I would say that all totalitarianisms are future-oriented. OK, I have two other questions, but I'll just let we have. Maybe we take the chance while the microphone is wandering to Griffith. Vladimir Tismanano, University of Maryland. Uh, no. Very, very good presentation on Arendt and uh, the totalitarian language. I would simply add that uh, if we look into Hannah Arendt, uh, she was a philosopher of resistance and exile. You remember very vividly, I'm sure, the fact that when she visited Paris in 1952, she uh, jotted down the famous line in her letter to Mary McCarthy, I met Albert Camus, the only honorable person here. Sorry, can you? I met Albert Camus, the only honorable person here. This is in 1952. Then she goes to Berkeley, California. Who is the person that she admires the most? Not our colleagues in political science department, not our colleagues in philosophy department, but Eric Hoffer, who offers her tours of San Francisco, and she writes to Carl Jaspers, finally, I met a mensch. Okay? This is about a man who was simply a worker. I mean, no, really, he read on his own Montaigne and Pascal and all the rest, but he discovered something that Hannah Arendt was desperately looking for communicating with about. Third, uh, so when I said exile and resistance, this is exactly the title of Albert Camus's works during the combat times during World War II. La philosophie de la résistance et de l'exil. La philosophie de la liberté, etc. So this is what Hannah Arendt is about. This is why Hannah Arendt is now number one on Amazon.com in political philosophy and political theory. Yes, number one, or the origins at this moment as we talk. Okay, not because of simply, uh, you know, any kind of, uh, I don't know, uh, German speculative, uh, in, in, a very impressive thing. Third, uh, on June 14th, you are in literary studies. On June 14th, 1907, Hannah Arendt's uh, favorite poet was born. Uh, she had two or three 20th century poets. One was uh, W.H. Auden, whom she deeply admired, and the other one was René Char. Uh, after all, her essay, Between Past and Future, starts with the famous line from René Char, we are the heirs for whom the will has not been written. There is no testament for us. We have to invent our testament. This is, I think, for our conference, this is the challenge of modernity in Hannah Arendt. How do we invent this testament? How do we retrieve? Somebody talked this morning about how Hannah Arendt looks for the novel, looks for the new. Hannah Arendt was a member. I'm a New York intellectual myself. I, I consider myself. I wrote extensively for Partisan Review. Uh, I knew quite well Susan Sontag. Uh, Hannah Arendt was a New York intellectual. She wrote for Partisan Review. That was for 40 years, she wrote 30 years. Also, we discussed this morning about that. How did she select the people for Ben in Dark Times? What was the criterion? Why it's there, Hermann Broch and not Stefan Zweig? 
So there is something very deep, and I think that for our workshop, it would be extremely interesting to look into this, uh, how do I call it, cultural, intellectual uh, constellations, you use the term, which is basically Benjamin's term. Okay, so it comes from Benjamin. Okay, so I think it's very, very important. I think it's a very interesting moment. And since you mentioned Donald Trump, I always tell my students and my friends, uh, probably the only thing we Americans owe to Donald Trump, or we liberal Americans owe to Donald Trump, is the fact that he brought back the great Central European literary tradition into the Milbro and even Highbro media in the United States. When The Atlantic publishes fragments from Mario and the Magician, uh, when uh, The New Yorker published fragments from uh, The Man Without Qualities by Muzi, during the elections, that's exactly when it happened. Okay, so something is very much in the air. That's why Arendt matters, to quote the wonderful book by the late Elizabeth Young Brühl, why does Hannah Arendt matter? I think it matters because we are ex re-experiencing conditions in many respects, uh, let's say isomorphical, that's a term so with sociologists here, you are a sociologist, okay? This is the isomorphism, this is Panofsky. Was, so, you know, the gothical architecture and medieval thought. So you bring two things together okay, and you yes, compare them. I understand. So, <laughs> I, I get it. I, yeah. uh, I, I completely agree. I don't think that, but I'm talking about the way she is being instrumentalized in many ways. I mean, when mm -hmm. Trump was elected, what, who? By journalists? By literary scholars? I mean, that I, I see it there, in The Guardian, Three days after Trump was elected, there were three articles about the relevancy of, of Hannah Arendt. Two of them were written by literary scholars. And why is this in the Because I think it's... Raman, sorry? Rather than bring to the day. I mean, you know, bring... I mean, why is this in instrumentalization for me means a kind of uh, symbolic manipulation? Is it a symbolic manipulation? Fine, it's a symbolic manipulation. You, you think want. so? Sure. Okay. Thank you. Ich habe nur eine ganz kleine Nachbemerkung zu Frau Bolls Frage an Frau Pavlik. Und das ist jetzt leider eher technisch und gar nicht so, so toll. Zu der Frage, wie geht das mit der Übertragung und geht es mit der Übertragung des reflexiven Urteils auf die politische Sphäre? Und da denke ich, erkenntnistheoretisch geht es ja genau um die Frage, äh, ob die Modalität des reflexiven Urteils, und ich spreche mit Habermas, jetzt kommt eben aus der Sphäre des erkenntnistheoretischen Urteils, von, von der Modalität her auch übertragbar ist auf die Sphäre der Interaktion und die Sphäre des Politischen. Und äh, das ist natürlich eine, ich, ich nenne das jetzt das ist eine ganz engagierte Utopie von Hannah Arendt. Und inwieweit das tatsächlich erarbeitbar und umsetzbar ist, das ist unser Job, daran weiterzuarbeiten. Mhm. Kann ich Ihnen da einfach zustimmen? Ja. ja. Okay, haben wir noch Fragen? Okay, but in a short way, when, if okay, possible. Um. Well, uh, coming back to uh, Zoe, um, uh, sorry, um, uh, you mentioned uh, Eichmann as, um, as an example of the language of totalitarianism, but uh, it seems that what he's speaking is actually the language of bureaucracy, which is not limited to totalitarianism. He, what he was, the kind of language that he used was definitely not the language of Hitler, for example, which was far more colorful than Eichmann's. Um, uh, okay. language. And also, um, the other thing is about um, the quote uh, in the handout that you gave. Um, actually, the first part of it, um, the first part of this quote, um, as a matter of fact, was very similar to the arguments that she made in um, between past and future. What she, what she meant, actually, in the first half of the, the handout is that crisis is not necessarily a bad thing because I mean, crisis features the breakdown of old institutions and old conventions. And as such, gives the opportunity for us to think anew because um, crisis uh, features the breakdown of all categories for subsuming, I mean, the all universals for subsuming the particulars. And so we leads, leads us into, uh, into the freedom of thinking. And, um, but the second half actually is reminiscent of what she, her argument in, um, 
in the human conditions where she, where, where she talk, talks about promise, the, the importance of promise, is like, similar to what she says about the importance of institutions here. Um, so, so in other words, she's making two kinds of arguments about institutions. The first part is about the breakdown of institutions, which allows us to think of new. But on the other hand, the second half of the argument is made uh, in, in relation to what she called the fragility of the human condition in the human condition, which means that we do need institutions. Thank you. Okay. You should have written my paper. <laughs> okay. <laughs> This is a very short answer, but um, time is running up, and, and we have the chance now for a break and uh, meet again in half an hour at um, uh, 15.30 for the next panel on multifaceted understanding of modernity. Thank you very much.